me in our call to worship um, by responding with a dark print. Once you lived in the darkness, find what is pleasing to God and follow God's way. The acts of darkness are left behind as you journey to God's light. Thanks be to God who gives us light. Open our eyes and our hearts to see your light of salvation. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able for a gathering song here in this place.
be in silent confession. Friends, sisters, brothers, hear this good news and see the grace of God. You are forgiven. You are free to go and live in the light of love. Thanks be to God. Amen.
get as dirty as they should anymore. <laughs> Did they get dirty? Yeah, well. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. So they came up with 30 things that kids should do before they reach the age of 10. Who's all here, 10? I am. 10, 10, okay.
Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of girls. So so uh, even though this this blind man is able to see now, those Pharisees could not get past the rigid rules. So in in reality, they were blind. They were blind to what was actually happening. Even though they could physically see, they were blind in their hearts. So, that is the lesson that I want to read to you today. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly God, we're here today, and we need the touch of God. We pray that lives will be changed so that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Margaret. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. Do not worry, I am not going to read the whole entire thing. Um, but I do encourage you all sometime this week, if you would go home and open up your Bible and read the entire text, um, it's, you won't be disappointed. But as for this morning, I am going to read verses 1 through 5. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered them, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So ends the reading of God's word. In 2004, Jamie Foxx won the Best Actor Oscar for his heart and soul portrayal of one of the most famous blind people in America, and that is Ray Charles. In the movie Ray, we learn things about Ray that we never knew. We learn, for example, of two other great blind spots in his life, unrelated to his actual physical blindness, which was that he led a double wife. He had a, a wife and a family at home, but while he was on the road, he um, had a lot of girlfriends, many of whom he introduced as his wife as well. And then he also was a heroin addict. And his addiction became so bad, it, it threatened to unravel pretty much about everything. The addiction was apparent to absolutely everyone but Ray. We also learned from the movie how Ray came to see the consequences of his actions upon himself and his family and others when he learns that one of his former girlfriends had died of a heroin overdose, the heroin to which he had introduced her. To his credit, in 1966, Ray entered a drug treatment facility, after which he stayed clean for the rest of his life. Now, I told you this story about Ray Charles to introduce you to another famous blind man whose name we don't even know, but whose story we hear today in the book of John. There are a few stories in the New Testament that are told as well as the story of the man who was born blind. Scenes that are smoothly connected, characters unfold before our very eyes, questions are answered in a timely fashion, and above all, the crisp dialogue, ironic at almost every point, unveils the satire of a man who is born blind and who comes to realize that there are people who prove that even though they can physically see, they're actually so blind in so many other ways. The Gospel of John is, is written toward the end of the first Christian century. It is the least historical and most symbolic of the four Gospels. Today's story is an outstanding example. The entire drama, with its characters and its dialogue, is it's an enactment parable of Jesus as the light of the world, who while enlightening some, proves absolutely blinding to others. Part of the essential background of this scripture 
is the animosity which developed between the Christians and the Jews in the first century. It must be acknowledged that out of these tensions, Christians were kicked out of the synagogues for believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Jews were blamed not only for killing Jesus, but for their continued refusal to acknowledge Jesus as a Messiah. In truth, the Pharisees were not as bad as a lot of these stories portray them to be. Of all the religious groups in Jesus' time, Jesus was closer to the Pharisees than any other group, which may explain why Nicodemus came to see him. In fact, if not for the Pharisees, we wouldn't have a lot of the Bible that we have today. They basically put it together at the Council of Gemma. Now this story raises deeper questions that we still ask today. Like, when misfortune strikes, whether of the man who is born blind or someone like Ray Child, Charles, is somebody to blame? Is it somebody's fault? And the second question is, how can people be so blind to realities right in front of their noses? Well, the first question, when misfortune strikes, is anyone to blame, is raised early on in this story. While out walking, Jesus and his disciples encounter a man who was born blind. And the disciples ask him, who sinned, the man or his parents? Now we know that there are some things that arise from the irresponsibility of others, which are best addressed in the courts of law, and that blame can be forthcoming and assigned right then and there. And yet there are other things that happen in life that are life accidents that we can neither predict nor prevent, and absolutely nobody is to blame. In Jesus' time, it was often the view that people who suffer from such things as birth defects or illnesses like leprosy are somehow to blame, and therefore morally suspect, and they are deemed unclean. Sadly, such people, as the blind man, were cut off from their families and from their religion and from their homes and their heritage. Fifteen years ago, when the tsunami in Asia happened, killed 230,000 people. There was a market research company that put out a survey and found that 26% of Americans believed that the tsunami was an act of God with religious significance. But it's likely that we're not surprised at this, because if you've ever suffered a misfortune in your life, either by birth or by accident, you likely already know that blaming the victim is not, unfortunately, an outdated misunderstanding. So with that in mind, I love, love, love Jesus' response here. And I especially like the version that Eugene Peterson put in his translation of the Bible, the message. So here's what Pastor Peterson wrote. You are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Instead, look for what God can do. It's undeniable that there is a lot of misery and suffering in the world, and yet instead of looking for someone to blame, look instead for what God can do, what we can do. Okay, so now the second major question of the story, the blind man that rises up is, how can people, how can people with perfectly good eyesight be so blind? Let me rephrase that. How can we sometimes be so blind 
to what is right in front of our very noses. And the story of the blind man might not have known much, but the one thing that he did know was this. I once was blind, but now I see. It was something that he was understandably excited about. But in this story, instead of responding with joy and thanksgiving, the Pharisees questioned him. They called him a liar. They questioned his character. And they threw him out. The problem was this. Despite the fact that he was healed, he, it couldn't possibly be of God because it had been done on the Sabbath. It was no use trying to confuse the Pharisees with the facts. Their minds were made up. It was outside the box of their rigid rules. So even though they could see that the man had been healed, they just couldn't admit it. All of us have known or we know people who are blind in this way. It might be a blindness about something that affects their health, like, oh, I don't know, smoking or drinking too much or overeating. It might be blindness to something emotionally obvious, like a relationship that's codependent or even abusive. Which brings us to the final and the most disturbing point of all, the possibility that we too may be completely blind to something that's right in front of our very faces. In reality, most of the time we believe what we believe for psychological or cultural reasons. It's true that when many of the great controversial moral issues are discussed and argued theoretically, well, those issues are very polarizing. But when they're discussed in terms of names and faces of people we know, compassion arises. I was finishing up my degree at UMD, um, and I was taking a sociology class. And there was a man in this class who was a really giant man. He was big, and he had a lot of opinions. And he took every opportunity he could to express those opinions. And right at the very top of those things that he felt very strongly about were, were welfare laws. Well, at the time, I was receiving AFDC, which is a to family with dependent children, welfare. And I had just about had it with him. So one day when he was particularly over the top, I was not like I was not brave enough to confront him in class, but I cornered him in the hallway after class, and I had him up against the wall, and I was pointing my finger right into his belly button because he was really a big guy. And I told him my story, and I didn't leave anything out. And after I was done, <laughs> I'm surprised he stood there, but after I was done, his eyes were big and his mouth was open, and he said, Oh, but I didn't mean you. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. You meant exactly me. Well, he went on to new rants after that. He never touched my issue, but um, yeah. Sadly, sometimes our eyes are, are open too late to respond with compassion rather than judgment. Well, after seeing the movie Ray, we might be tempted to jump to a judgment about Ray Charles. But the movie also helped us to see Ray with compassion and understand why he may have had some of those blindnesses that he had, both literal and psychological. You see, Ray Charles Robinson was not born blind, but he became blind around the age of seven from undiagnosed glaucoma. About two years before he lost his sight, he witnessed the drowning death of his little brother George. In a memory that haunted his whole entire life, he stood nailed to the spot while his little brother freakish, freakishly 
drunk in a tub of clothes that were being washed. So why didn't Ray save him? Because he was five years old. No one seeing the scene in the movie Ray would think to blame that little boy. And yet he never forgave himself. So knowing this about Ray, we're moved to respond not with judgment, but rather with compassion. The ironic reversals in the story of the man born blind is that in the beginning is the, the man born blind who is the sinner, according to society. But at the end of the story, it turns out that it's the Pharisees who are really blind. And they are the sinners. Because quick in their certainty and their rigidness of their theology, they are incapable of responding with compassion, either to the blind man or to Jesus. Says Jesus, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made a great presence of seeing will be exposed as blind. My friends, Jesus is the light of the world. Open yourselves to fill your minds with his peace and your heart with his love. So be it. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able for our sovereign response. Open my eyes that I may see.
between planning and preparation. We can't plan the future that God holds. But we can prepare for each day by practices of generosity. Generosity helps us to forgive and to heal. It helps us to make peace in the world. It helps to bring justice and mercy to those in need. Our gifts this morning are one way that we prepare for God's coming into the world in the most unexpected ways. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and in praise. The ushers will now wait on us for our morning's gifts and offerings. Yeah, fast. <laughs> and then come up here in the sanctuary, and there's going to be 
the Planning for the Inevitable series that we are doing. Um, are there other announcements that anybody would like to lift up? Oh, Savannah. Oh, she rolls up. Do you want to come up for the, do you want the microphone? No? Okay. Cheering for pies, I like it. See Savannah. The, there's a fundraiser going on for the cheerleading squad to earn money to buy their uniforms because there's so many people interested in cheerleading these days. So Savannah's going to be um, taking orders for pies. So she can fill you in all the rest of the details. Louise. Just a reminder that next Sunday is the last day to order the Easter plants and make your payment because on the next day we'll be ordering them from uh, Anderson's Greenhouse. So be sure if you'd like to do it in honor or memory of family members or friends to do that this week or next week. Order your plants for Easter Sunday. All right. Hill. I can uh, report to all of you that council has given the okay to uh, destruct the fellowship hall floor. As you know, we've had water problems for years down there, and the carpet is in need of change, so we're going to be taking that out. And through the generosity of a uh, member of the congregation, we'll be putting down a new floor. So if you see things missing, like molding along the floor, doors, uh, chairs, tables, and all those things, the reason is that we need to get everything out of there in order to uh, have that floor put down. I believe the date is the 24th, 5th, and 6th right. of April. If you have some spare time, talk to uh, either Mike Lynn or me or uh, Mark Gordon, and we'll be working at probably odd hours to get some of that work done. So be aware, it's not going to look the same in about a month. Thank you. Yeah, big facelift coming up. Many hands, light work or lighter work. So please talk to Bill if you want to help out. Uh, anything else? Okay, then. What I would like to say is, now may the Lord's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace in your comings and your goings, in your sitting and in your rising, in your work and in your play, in your joy and in your sorrow, in your laughter and in your tears, until that day comes which is without dawn and without darkness. Amen. I invite you now to stand for our sending song. I'm going to 